Okay, hello everyone. My name is Kasia Wojciak and I'm delighted to welcome you to our Facebook Live session on using vocabulary in chunks. It may sound quite mysterious, but I have two fantastic colleagues to explain all that to us today. Um, I have Nazreen, hello. Hi. And I have Mark, Hi. hello. Hi. Um, as always, we'd like to hear from the audience, so let us know where you're joining us from. And meantime, Nisreen and Mark, can you tell us a few words about yourself? Yeah, so I suppose I have a slightly strange background. Um, my background, actually, in teaching background, is in first language speakers of English. So I taught English in uh, schools in the UK and in London specifically. Um, and actually, for a while, I taught um, students in what's called a referral unit. So those are for very naughty students um, who were kicked out and uh, out of mainstream school. Um, and after a while, I, I decided I want to switch to a research focus and work in a second language. Um, so for the last kind of 10 years or so, I've been looking at language development, um, both here and uh, for universities. Okay, great. Sounds like a great career. Yes, yeah, it's very interesting. Very, very interesting, yeah. yeah. Nisreen? Uh, I'm Nisreen Ash. I was raised in Damascus, in Syria, um, and I didn't speak uh, English at home. We spoke Arabic, actually, so I learned my English at school, and then I ended up teaching English, uh, and then uh, helping teachers to teach English, and so my career developed from teaching to working with teachers. Um, and I'm delighted to be here and share my experience as an English language learner. Great, fantastic. Yeah, I think we have a similar yes. career path in yes, a way. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, and just to say, we have people joining us from Indonesia, Spain, Greece, um, Brazil, um, Vietnam, uh, Russia, all over the world, Morocco, um, Siberia, there you go, Barcelona, Greece, France, so the whole world wow. is with us, yes. <laughs> okay, um, Sreen and Mark, using vocabulary in chunks, can you just un unravel the, the secret to us? Chunks, um, I, you know, when I was learning uh, English, I wondered what chunks mean, so uh, Mark, what are chunks? Yeah, so I suppose uh, there was a kind of an old traditional view of um, language, which said basically what you have are individual words, something like a dictionary, um, and then a set of fairly abstract rules for putting those words together, grammar. Um, and the idea was that you built your sentences one word at a time using those kind of abstract grammar rules, right? So, you know, an adjective can go with a noun, so you find your adjective, and you put it with a noun, and so on. Um, what modern linguistics has actually found is it's a bit more nuanced than that. So when you look at actually the way people use language, um, what you find is that lots of words kind of often get used together. So um, if you take two words like good um, and morning, um, obviously they're used in lots of contexts. So you can have um, a good day, you can have good food, um, you can have a fun morning, a happy morning. Um, but there's a very specific context in which you find those two words together. So, um, you know, whenever I come into the office, um, the first thing people say to each other is... Good morning. Exactly, <laughs> right? So in sense, these two words, they go together much more commonly, much more frequently, and they come almost as a trunk. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when you start looking, you kind of see them everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, also, like when we say happy birthday, we don't say merry birthday, uh, or may you be healthy every year on this day, <laughs> we would just say happy birthday. But yeah. obviously other languages have different ways of putting it together. I mean, that's it. It's a very specific yeah. way. So a different language have very specific ways of saying things. Um, there'd be nothing wrong with saying coming in and saying a joyous birthday and you know, a natural English speaker would understand what you meant um, but it's just not the way um, naturally English speaker is English you would just say happy birthday to wish someone a happy birthday. When we were preparing for this um, live session with um, for today we looked at a number of examples and one of the um, examples that we looked across a number of languages is strong tea. Um, I love tea and uh, when I was learning uh, English uh, I found that sometimes I may use the wrong word because in Arabic I would say something slightly different. So um, I'd like to show you an example of uh, a different way of expressing strong tea in a number of languages. It's uh, the one before, yep, uh, one, okay. oh, this one, yes. Um, and uh, no, actually, you were actually right. But okay. anyway, um, when we say strong tea in English, uh, we don't say powerful tea. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, you know um, I had also discussed with my uh, students in the past is um, uh, is uh, whether we say um, powerful tea, uh, heavy tea. Uh, a powerful tea. I remember one student asking me about it, and uh, we just um, felt that okay, let's look at um, how often this was used and uh, and see contrast it with strong tea. 
we found that people rarely ever used in England a uh, powerful tea since the 18, what, the 800? Um, yeah, for, for a long time. For a we, very long time, We yeah. actually have, I think if we go back, we've got um, this was, a graph yeah. that kind of illustrates this. And this is kind of a nice, clear way of just showing um, what these chunks look like and how frequent they are. So um, what you've got in front of you is just a graph I pulled off um, from Google Ngrams. You don't need to worry about what that is. Um, but you see you've got two um, different word combinations. So one is strong tea, which is the natural English chunk for um, talking about a really strongly flavored tea. Um, an alternative way of potentially saying it, which is powerful tea. Now again, if someone said powerful tea, you sort of know what they meant. But if you look at the frequencies, you can see it's clearly different, right? Strong tea is much more frequent it's the combination, it's the chunk that natural English speakers tend to use. You know, I might think if someone says to me, powerful tea now, uh, like it has a specific medicinal um, Yes, that's quality. why I would yeah. 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 But So it might distort the meaning a little bit. Um, but when we researched um, strong tea in different languages, and that is the next slide, uh, um, we, we found that it's expressed slightly differently in different languages. So in Portuguese, for example, it is said in a way, that indicates intense tea uh, or even strong tea. But in Mongolian, they don't, they say something that means thick tea. So if they're translating from Mongolian, they will be saying thick tea. Maybe if you translate strong tea to Mongolian, literally, it wouldn't make sense. And the same thing with Turkish, they would say dark tea um, and in Arabic, heavy tea. So it's just a different concept and a different way of uh, constructing words together. But in English, if you want to sound more natural, then you would say strong tea. And what do you say, uh, Kasia, in uh, Polish? Because that's your mother tongue. Yes. Um, so we also say strong tea, mocna herbata. Okay. Yes, okay. So, so it's similar. Easy. Yes. Yeah. Easy, easy for Polish speakers. <laughs> yeah. um, what would you say in your language? So please try to share with us uh, what you would say uh, strong tea in your mother tongue. And also the literal translation of it. So we will see how different it would sound or would the concept would be in your language. Brilliant. We also researched another example, uh, and this one uh, was to do with rain, because you know how much it rains in uh, the UK. I think we're quite typical, so we and rain. And with heavy rain, uh, that was also interesting. Uh, in Portuguese, um, it, the Portuguese wording for it is, or chunk, is a lot of rain. But when uh, in Mongolian, rain with lots of water, interesting. Uh, in Turkish, it's heavy rain, so that's an easy one for mm -hmm. Turkish speakers. In Arabic, it's profuse rain or even rains in the plural. Uh, what would you say in uh, Polish? I'm thinking we say silnipada, so I think it would be like strong rain. Rather than heavy, yeah. Strong rain, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, strong in Arabic is interesting. It just indicates more like strength if, in terms of power. So if you say strong rain, it's a bit like, you know, the rain doesn't have strength. Um, so yeah, languages are fascinating. Um, different way of expressing things. But in English, it's heavy rain. Okay. Um, we, have some, uh, we have some replies. So um, in Greek, apparently, we say dark or black tea and um, that's good and then i think that was oh, so many comments um it's like turkish yes yeah. uh, and here i think this is russian so they say solid or sturdy very rough translation yeah that was okay we after. okay i mean kind of what's interesting is that they're all picking up on the same kind of meaning mm. so it's that same core but just each language has a very specific way of expressing it. And that's part of what it means to know the language is to know those chunks so to speak english really naturally is to say strong tea rather yes. than powerful tea even though that core of meaning is sort of the same and you see that overlap across the, the examples we've got here yeah. I think there was a nice example here from Mexico where the comments come so quickly that I tend to lose them. Uh, but it was about the tea is um, loaded. Oh, yeah, te cargado. That's mm. literally meaning loaded tea. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah. yeah. Loaded I don't know how I have to remember yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, language is fascinating. What would you say for heavy rain? Uh, that would be another um, thing to share as well. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there's some. Uh, interesting way of looking at the rain and the heaviness of the rain. Um, yes, okay, we have um, an example from Russia, more like strong rain in Russian. Yeah, Great. yeah, good. Um, but, you know, sometimes when I, as a, an ex-learner, um, actually an always English language learner, um, I sometimes wondered, like, are all chunks the same? 
Um, and um, I'd like to ask you, Mark, because you're the researcher here and you spent years looking into chunks. Uh, so what do you think? So, yeah, so the, the simple answer is no, not all chunks are the same. Um, the longer answer will take a long lecture and we don't want to give you that here. <laughs> um, so basically there are lots of kind of different kinds of chunks um, and probably a nice way to think about them is that they come in um, lots of different flavours, right? Um, so um, one flavour is how many words they have. So the examples we've already seen have two words, so good morning, happy birthday. But in fact, chunks can have any number of words. Um, so you can have one with five words, which is the love of my life, which is how I describe my wife, um, <laughs> whether I'm in a good or bad mood. Um, but you can actually have whole sentences. So lots of languages will have proverbs, um, ways of kind of um, condensing a lot of wisdom into a single sentence. So there's an English one, the early bird catches the worm, which basically means the person who gets up first and goes ahead and does something will win, will succeed. Um, Another way of looking at them, which is quite an interesting one, is whether it's easy to guess the meaning. So some of them, it's fairly clear. If you know the meaning of the individual words, you can work out what, it's mean, what it means. So um, in English, we tend to talk about fast cars rather than quick cars. Mm -hmm. So if you heard the phrase fast cars, you'd know what it meant if you know what fast and what cars mean. Um, but some of them are a little more um, harder to work out. So um, you know, if, as we hope, you pass your Cambridge exams with flying colors, um, that might sound a bit strange. Um, but what that basically means is um, you did really well. You got the best mark you could possibly have. Um, but there's no way that someone who didn't grow up speaking English would be able to work out if you knew what the word flying meant, if you knew what the word colours meant. Well, you put them together and it sounds very strange. Mm. What, what do you mean flying colours? What does that mean? Um, I was once um, told, oh, on the screen, everybody thinks you're the bee's knees. And I thought, that sounds really positive, but I didn't know quite what, what, <laughs> where, what, where the bees and the knees meant together, you know, so um, I just thought, well, you know, that's pretty uh, interesting. So I went home and I Googled it and I found out that it means that I, it means I'm a really good person. <laughs> you okay. know? And I really liked okay. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but what um, really um, sort of like sometimes um, struck me is that how people like would use them and when would I use that kind of expression? Because you know, it's like when the first time it was used, I just didn't know, you know, how to replicate it again. So it can be a bit challenging, as we understand, uh, using not the most easy chunks in your language. Yeah, I mean, and, and they use for different things, right? So some are just chunks for things. Um, so if I refer to uh, your sunny smile, you know, that's picking out a thing in the world, your smile. Um, but other chunks, they help to link bits of a sentence together. Um, so a couple you probably heard of, you say as well as or as soon as. You know, there's a particular chunk that helps you link two things together and it ensures that the sentence hangs together as a complete sentence. Um, and then lastly, one that's a bit sort of trickier to, to get your head around um, is just whether they can use by themselves, right? So some are more or less complete phrases. So we've, mm -hmm. again, the, the two of you earlier, if you walked into the office and said, good morning, people wouldn't expect to say anything more. Um, but there are some chunks that basically need something else to finish them. Um, so again, these examples of chunks that link something like as well as, if I said, you know, um, there are chunks for things as well as, and naturally, English speakers say, well, okay, as well as what? Mm -hmm. um, so there are chunks that actually require you to fill them out and have something at the end. Um, and again, this is why they can be quite useful, because they're a short-term way of bridging the things and allow you to think of what you want to say um, while you're building a sentence. Functional chunks, I like to call them. But yes. that's not scientific. That's just Nasreen's way of referring to chunks. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's really, in some sense, however you want to refer to them. And in fact, if you look really closely at the literature, which I don't suggest it, one does, um, <laughs> you'll find that linguists don't actually always speak about them in common ways. So there's lots of different ways to think about them. So if that's a way that helps you to think about it, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've had different um, various um, presentations and live sessions on chunks. Uh, so previously on Facebook, uh, we've discussed the reasons why people um, use uh, language chunks. And obviously there are various reasons. And one of the, the reasons is um, to be able to feel like you're part of the group. So it's group membership. And that could be becoming part of the English language speaking group uh, in, say, in England, for example, or it could be a subgroup within that uh, bigger group. Um, and a good example on that is football, the subgroup. Um, I give it to you, Mark, because you're a football fan. Fact, I am a football uh, fan. You can probably they, explain that much better than me. Although, if you ask my dad and you ask him what team I support, my dad, I think would disagree. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, football's a really nice example where you have lots of colourful chunks, really striking chunks that, if you don't follow the football, they just sound a bit weird. Right. Um, so if you would hear a commentator saying they need to hold on until the final whistle, 
you could probably work out what it is. But really, you need to know that to finish a football game, the referee needs to blow a whistle and say, this is the end of the game. Yeah. So again, if you don't follow football, if you're not part of it, it just sounds a bit strange. It's not obvious what it means. Um, and then I think the other ones we're talking about are some sort of kind of just easy to remember. So yeah. some that actually generally you come across, and you think that's a really striking one. Um, so I think we, we talked about a couple of examples earlier. Um, well, um, sunny smile. Sunny smile, that's a kind of but, nice one. Yeah, bees knees. Um, <laughs> yeah. And this again, something that's like as good as gold, right? Again, yeah. it's, it's really clear what it means, but it's just a nice way of summing something up. So you, you hear it, and it's, it just it just works. So you're happy to use it again. Um, yeah, yeah. Another kind of uh, a bit more boring one is actually people just like to repeat things. Um, and it's one of those those things about the way human beings are. Once you've said something a certain way, it's just easier to say it again. So when you're part of a language community, you just tend to repeat things over and over again. Mm -hmm. So phrases come to be used in a certain way words come to be combined and become a chunk. Yeah. Um, and the last one, probably the one that's like most relevant and most interesting is, it's really useful for um, fluency, right? So if you know the right chunks, then you don't have to construct a sentence word by word. Um, it makes it much easier to speak and understand English because you're not spending so much energy trying to think, how do I build this sentence? You almost know what that sentence is going to look like. And actually, interestingly, the person you're speaking to, if they are a natural English speaker, they all know as well. So they're working with you because they'll be thinking, I'm ready for these to say these certain words. So it makes it much easier for me to understand what they're saying. Okay, great. What about, can I ask a question? Mm. What yeah. about Ray of Sunshine? Is that also a chunk? Yes, yeah, that's yeah. a Ray Khan one. Um, it's obviously kind of quite poetic, but it's it's something, um, you know, actually it's, it's a cliche in some sense, so quite a worn out phrase, but it's something we use all the time. My wife and I, we have a four year old who is most of the time um, our ray of sunshine. <laughs> Not the the eyes. Yes, the upper <laughs> eyes. Um, yeah, also, yeah, most of the time he's a ray of sunshine. Okay. That's actually how we kind of describe him. Mm -hmm. well. And a football fan. Uh, not yet. Not yet. We'll there, there's a bit of a debate because my dad is, I'm a, a Tottenham Hotspur fan, if that means anything to people. And my dad is a West Ham fan. We tend to disagree a lot. So there's, <laughs> there is an <laughs> argument even as, 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 uh, as to where yeah. he will go for his first football game. Mm. Um, I suspect dad will win because he has more time. Mm. Mm. Well, back again to you know learning English. Uh, why should we care about learning these chunks? Um, you know, one of the, the because you're you're trying to cope with so many things when you're learning English tense grammar, writing, reading, all these skills, all the exams you have to do. And on top of that, you've got these chunks to, you know, to pick up. So why should we care, Mark? So, I mean, there are a number of reasons. Um, one is something called the Common European Framework Reference. Um, that may mean something to some of you, not to others. Um, but if you're ever wondering why our qualification exams start with um, a letter and a number, so B1 or B2, um, B2 uh, first, B1 proficiency, uh, sorry, B1 first, so B1 preliminary, B2 first. B, what, yeah, um, B2 first. Yeah. The reason for those letters and those numbers is the Common European Framework of Reference. Um, that is basically an international document uh, produced by the Council of Europe, and it describes what language learners can do at each skill level. Right. So you start off with A1. As you get better, you move up through the levels. So you go from A1 to A2, B1 to B2, and C1. Finally, C2, where you're more or less speaking as if you were a natural speaker of English. Um, and what we tend to find is if you actually look at what's in the common European framework of reference, we find references to chunks. Right? So at B2, it says that B2 learners can produce, um, and this is a technical term, the appropriate collocations of many words. And collocations is just a very specific word for a kind of chunk, right? So um, we've already seen these things like good morning, happy birthday, these are examples of a chunk or a collocation. Um, and obviously, because we queue our exams um, to the common European framework of reference, they're part of our exams, right? So our reading questions, they specifically will test your knowledge of things like um, chunks, things like phrasal verbs, idioms, thick phrases. Um, and also for writing, things we look for is um, a greater range of vocabulary. So the higher level speakers will draw on um, a greater range of words. And actually part of that greater range of words is a greater range of chunks. There has been a question from Natalia. She asked, can we use chunks in writing? And I think you've just answered that. Yes, yeah, you can use them in all kinds of language. I mean. It's one of those weird things that until people started looking at it, um, really kind of after the 1960s and just had large database of language, people weren't really that cued into it. But when you look at how language is actually used and you, you just basically count things, you see them everywhere. Um, and actually different kinds of language will have very specific chunks. Mm -hmm. So the kind of chunks you would use in um, spoken English, something like good morning, is not the kind of chunk that you would use in an academic essay, right? So an academic essay, a more common chunk would be something like, um, it is important to people have suggested that, or even um, on the one hand, 
on the other hand, something like next section. So all kinds of languages have chunks. Um, and actually, the more specific the genre, the more specific the kind of language, um, the more specific the chunks can be. Yeah. Can't use been there, done that in academic papers. You could do, but you might be, you <laughs> might be, mark, be. You might be mark, marked down with, yeah, for sure. Um, or the bee's knees. <laughs> and actually, partly this is why chunks can be very difficult for second language learners, because um, you need exposure to those very specific kinds of language, and that's actually quite hard if you have access to. It also depends what, why you're learning English yes. and, and whether you want it for communication, you want it for uh, formal, informal purposes, uh, and so you focus on which type of chunks that would serve the purpose that you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, so just other reasons really, you know, natural English speakers use them, right? So mm -hmm. if you use them, you will sound more like a natural English speaker. Um, and critically, um, it's both easier for you to understand them because they use it. And actually studies have shown that um, they've given passages to students um, and even students will know the individual words because they're not familiar with the chunks. They can mm -hmm. find it hard to understand the overall passage. Um, and vice versa, natural English speakers will find it easier to understand what you're saying. Um, because again, it's just part of the way we say things. So if you yeah. said something like um, joyous morning when you walked into the office, we'd all know what you know, second language <laughs> speaker meant. We'd all be fine with it, but it's just not the way that a natural English speaker would say it. Um, and of course, finally, you know, they will also help your own fluency, right? So if you're familiar with these chunks, you will not have to spend time building each sentence word by word. You can draw on these things in the same way that a natural speaker does to make your job easier. I once tested um, translating back a chunk to Arabic with my mother. Mm. So um, she offered me a piece of cake. She said, would you like this cake? We were conversing in Arabic. And I said, uh, and in English, if someone is offering me a piece of cake or something to eat, I would say, uh, no, I'm fine. It's fine to say that. No, I'm fine. That's also a chunk. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. I took that to Arabic and, I, and my mom said, uh, would you like a piece of cake? And I said, no, I'm fine. And she said, I didn't ask, how are you? <laughs> and I was like, that was okay. that was a good effect, mm -hmm. you know. So she's a native speaker of Arabic, another language. And she was like, that didn't make sense to her. So think about them in the sense when you're thinking about your mother tongue, how would it sound like if someone is learning Portuguese, Arabic, um, or whatever language you speak, and how, you know, like, how natural it would sound in your language. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of the striking things that once you start being aware of them, I mean, when I started studying language, it was not something I was aware of. But once you start thinking about chunks, you actually start noticing them. So when you're speaking in your own language, you'll find yourself being able to predict what you're going to say next, or in fact, what another speaker is going to say to you next. Um, and it, that's nice to do as an experiment if you are just listening to someone speak in your own language. Just see if you can start predicting the kind of words they're going to use based on what they've already said. You'll find you can do that quite well because chunks are there in your language as well. So if I need more help as a learner to, to learn more and pick up more um, chunks um, so that I would improve my language and I would reach a higher level of fluency, where can I find out more? So I think we were talking, we, we came up with a number of suggestions. Um, so the first one we were going to suggest is something called English Vocabulary Profile. That's something that we at Cambridge Assessment have done with um, our colleagues at Cambridge University Press. Um, that's a very nice resource. Um, it's a website which basically lists um, a load of words that are characteristic of each um, common framework level. Um, so there will be chunks for A1 learners, chunks for A2 learners. Um, and you'll find you can search for things like phrases, for idioms, phrasal verbs, and they help you identify specifically the kind of chunks you should be using basically where you are um, and also where you might want to go. So if you are working around a B2 level, um, you will be able to identify chunks that are relevant to B2, but also maybe to C1 if you want to start pushing yourself a little bit more. Um, that's nice as a, as a, um, a sort of reference work, like a dictionary. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want some practical exercises, um, there are two very nice um, series of books by our colleagues at the press. Um, so one is called um, English Collocations in Use as a series. There's one for intermediate, which is for B1, B2, um, and for advanced, C1, C2. This has a range of really nice exercises for just identifying all the different kinds of chunks there are um, for things called collocations. And actually, once you look at it, you'll see just how frequent they are. It'd be really surprising just how much of English is drawing on these, these patterns, these chunks. Um, and then another one we've got is English Idioms in Use. Idioms are just another kind of chunk. And the reason we've chosen collocations and idioms they're the ones that are specifically talked about in the common framework of reference. So when it talks about B2 language and C2 language, it's talking about collocations and idioms. So these are really nice texts to use. Um, and then finally, um, 
we also have some YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got three small YouTube videos that um, a colleague, um, Tom Booth of ours, has done. Um, and they're just nice for giving you lots of concrete examples and for just getting more familiar with the idea of what trumps are um, and potentially how you could use them in um, speech particularly. Great, brilliant. Thank you very much. That was very useful. Um, one I think that I use very often is welcome along to. Mm -hmm. So welcome along to our presentation, welcome along to our program, welcome along to whatever else. And yeah. I think that is also yeah. a chance. Mate. It can be a very individual thing as well. Mm. Um, different people rely on them to certain extents. Um, and it can vary depending on the situation. So um, a while back, many years back, I did a podcast for a magazine in, in this country. Um, I thought I was talking very smoothly, and when I listened back to it, I realized I said the phrase kind of more or less every sentence. And that's because at that point, I was really, really nervous, mm -hmm. and it was just, I, I couldn't stop saying it. So there are these really individual ways of doing things as well. Okay. Great. I have a few uh, comments and questions, the kind of like comment slash mm -hmm. uh, questions. Um, someone has said, um, the more you read, that was Magda, the more you read, the higher amount of chunks you learn in context. So that is probably just an advice. So is reading also a thing where you can learn the chunks not only from listening or, or, or watching native speakers? Yeah, yeah, so part of the key thing is really just quantity, to be honest, mm. is, is getting lots of exposure to different kinds of language. Because um, it, it's one of the difficult things actually about chunks is that in a sense, chunks are everywhere but specific chunks aren't always used that frequently. Um, so the more you read, the more you expose language, the better chance you have of seeing them and picking up on them. Um, but particularly, you know, if you want to pick up on chunks that are used in writing, then you really need to expose yourself to, to different kinds of writing. Um, and yeah. the key is also different kinds of writing. Right? So stories will have different kinds of chunks to things like academic writing. Um, and interesting, the emphasis will vary. So you'll probably find more chunks in academic writing because it's a, it's a much more standard way of writing, much less individual. Whereas fiction, the kind of thing we want is actually, we don't want lots of cliches, right? We don't want lots of, we want the best writers using the language at the top range. Um, so they're less relevant things like novels, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Rosanna is saying, um, for example, she heard, I went vegan instead, instead of I got vegan. I think you say like, I when or became vegan? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and what's interesting about that is that's, a, that's an example of a chunk where actually one bit of it you can change. Right? Mm -hmm. So there is the phrase, I've gone, meaning I've become something. So I've okay. gone vegan. You could say, I've gone vegetarian. You could say, um, actually, I've gone carnivorous. They just, I've decided to eat nothing but meat. Um, so some chunks actually have a bit of flexibility mm -hmm. built into them. Um, and so, yeah, but that's, that's a nice one because actually also that's a nice modern one. So okay, it's not yeah. just these are things that happen there since... The beginning of time that's another chunk or the dawn of time that's another chunk and you get new ones developing because language changes people need to do new things with them so we develop new chunks to make it easier to do those things absolutely it's also good to ask if you're not sure about something especially in a conversation so uh like until this morning um i, I well i learned this morning a new chunk actually it is a confession okay, can share uh, that with us? <laughs> well it's the uh kick the bucket i learned it from you okay <laughs> and I was, I was like well it, does that mean you got angry um because you know i would kick the bucket if i'm a bit okay, angry good. and turned out that that wasn't the meaning actually so um would is there anyone online who can uh who knows the meaning of Kicking the bucket. Am I saying it all right? Is you are saying it right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It was yeah. always a, it's like a weird one for me because I, yeah. <laughs> when I um, did English at university, when I studied it formally, I used it. I seem to use it in a slightly different way to most English speakers. Mm -hmm. But in, in English, it has a very specific meaning, and it's not at all what you think. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we will leave that with you guys. Meantime, there is one more question. Um, Gladys is asking. Um, any ideas to teach C1 collocations? My students have a very hard time learning them. Yeah, and it, it is worth saying that it takes a while to learn chunks, and particularly those high level chunks, because often you're drawing on very specific kinds of language where it's hard to get lots of exposure to it. Um, so I would say the key thing is to target particular kinds of language, so particular academic essays. Um, I would look at the books we've, we've mentioned, um, so the collocations in use for the advanced one, okay. you know, and mm -hmm. the idioms in use for the advanced one. Um, they will identify specific kinds of collocations. Um, but there are techniques that seem to be quite useful. Um, so if you are aware of um, the kind of characteristic chunks of the language you're showing them, you can underline them. Um, you can get them to start picking out 
um, things that they think are chunks and get them to talk about them. And actually, these things can have it can have a quite a weird effect. So there have been studies where um, they've tried to teach specific chunks. And what they found is that actually learners didn't necessarily pick up those chunks, but actually they were much more aware of chunks they already knew um, and were able to draw on them much more productively. And also at C1, your learning starts to plateau a little bit, so you don't really, you know, notice the things that you're learning because you don't feel you've already established communication. Uh, you're picking up things quicker than you think, and you're using them. So you don't feel the the change that you had when you were still learning, you know, basic things in A1, A2 levels. Um, so don't be intimidated by that. You are still picking up things, but you probably don't realize that you're picking them yeah. up whilst you're learning and being exposed to different sources. And it is worth saying, you know, that they are not everything. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea is not to literally stuff your writing or your speaking with every chunk you can kind of think of. Um, it's about building a familiarity, building your awareness, and over time they will come into the language you use. Um, and building your style as well, because yeah, every it, person has their own style. It is true. I mean, I, yeah. I find that in my essays, I was, you know, I, I have one particular word, so it's not just chunks, you have words that you tend to, to like, um, mm. the word dust, I always use that. I do, I use dust too, <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like I... I, I, I yeah. overuse dust, yeah. I overuse yeah. But, yeah, and so part of it is also about you know, picking up on, on things you might be overusing. So one thing we find that, that second languages learners do is they tend to um, overuse very common chunks, so chunks they've picked up. And they might use them a lot more frequently than um, a first language speaker of English would okay. do. So partly it's also about being aware of um, the own language you use. Um, mm -hmm. It's easy with writing because obviously you can go back and read over it um, and just get a sense of, am I actually repeating things a bit too much? Because um, there is, a, there is a, a, a tricky balance to get between using the right amount. Um, okay. Although there is, the right amount covers a lot of ground. Right? So it, mm -hmm. you don't need to be that specific, but just get a sense of, are there chunks perhaps I'm using too much? Um, there are also cool chunks. So we've got some responses to uh, your your question or our question. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like um, it means to die. Yes. 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 <laughs> Very pleasant. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice illustration of just how weird chunks. Can yeah. Be. Yeah. Um, because you wouldn't think the phrase kick the bucket. And I've, it's one of the things I've never, I've decided I would never actually look at why it means what it does. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have a bit of mystery. But there is, it's used in formal speech. If you're referring to someone's kick the bucket, and particularly you, you'd use it for someone you didn't know. So mm -hmm. we have no kind of, it means if someone kicked the bucket, it means that they died. It's not rude to say, is it? No, it's you would just... use it in a formal context. Okay. Um, not about, you know, unlikely about someone you were very close to. Um, but somebody saw in the news, or um, somebody's had perhaps a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It is you will find naturally English speakers using it, and it, it sounds very odd. But it's less frequent than other yes. ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a yeah. question from Sally. Uh, she's asking if it's the same phrase as pushing up the daisies. Yes, pushing up yes. the daisies is another is another way of saying that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there was actually a TV program I think was that was played on that as a title. But yeah, pushing up daisies also means someone. Um, has died and they, they, they've been buried on the ground, basically. Departed. Okay. Yeah. Um, fantastic. And do you remember when we were talking about um, passing an exam with flying colours? Yes. There was a comment I noted here from Leo. He said that sometimes I make the mistake of translating it literally in Spanish to tell my students the ace, to say the ace a test, and I realise it makes no sense in Spanish. So mm. that's, yeah, it's interesting. As you said, you have to be quite careful when you... When you translate that, I mean, it's it's a really nuanced thing. It's a, it, you know all second language learners do it. Um, I mean, it, you know, my um, my father-in-law is Russian, um, and in Russian you say you don't give a lecture, you read a lecture. Um, but he still uses the phrase in English. He says, "Are you going to you know? Did you read a lecture last week?" And I kept saying, "It took me a while to remember." <laughs> no, he's mm. that's the Russian version of saying, "Did I give a lecture last week?" Which I was, yes. Yeah. Okay, and uh, one more question. What is the difference between chunks and idioms? So um, we're using chunks um, as an informal way of covering all kinds of um, groups of words that go together a lot. Um, linguists have lots of different terms for lots of different kind of, of um, chunks. What makes idioms special is that they're the ones that really it's quite hard to work out what they mean when you put the two words together, right? They're a really specific way of doing it and really, really, really nuanced way of doing it. So um, an idiomatic way of saying to die is kick 
the bucket, pushing up the daisies. Um, so that's what idioms tend to refer to. Um, they tend to be quite colorful. Um, they tend to um, not be very literal, right? So if you're saying someone is as good as gold, well, they're not really as good as gold, because how can gold, you know, gold be good? It doesn't quite make sense. It's just a little kind of tick, a little specific way of English have of, of describing A bit poetic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so too, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think uh, that will be it from us this afternoon. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. And if we haven't gone back to you yet, we'll definitely do it in writing. So we'll um, answer to your questions. Uh, make sure you go to our Facebook page and give it a like, and then you will get reminders about our Facebook Live sessions. So do follow up. And to both Mark and Nasreen, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks for um, watching us today. Yeah, we really enjoyed it.